He was one of the last romantics who redefined what the symphony orchestra was capable of doing, brought opera to the brink of both atonality and scandal, and whose expedient political alliances, born out of sheer necessity, were long misunderstood by his critics. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Richard Strauss. Richard Strauss was born in June 1864 in Munich. Strauss's father Franz was an amateur composer, but he was primarily a virtuoso horn player, who was extremely classical in his outlook. Even though Franz made a living performing the operas of Richard Wagner, he very deeply disliked Wagner, and he didn't want his son to be studying such music. And so the young Richard was inculcated in his father's style, preferring the works of Mozart and Beethoven. The most progressive that they got was probably Mendelssohn. The younger Strauss would long have a love for the sound of the horn and of brass instruments in general. Eventually, Strauss made it to Berlin, where, having dropped out of being a philosophy major in Munich, began studying conducting under the esteemed tutelage of Hans von Bülow, who just seems to be everywhere in all these biographies. It was through the hands-on experience that Strauss got as an assistant conductor to von Bülow that he truly began to discover the harmonically adventurous and orchestrally virtuosic writing of composers like, you guessed it, Richard Wagner. From this point forward, we see an ever bolder Strauss write ever bigger and ever more demanding pieces, feeling his way out into his style. Still, von Bülow and Strauss did not always see eye to eye, which was actually quite valuable for Strauss. He could always rely on von Bülow to give him honest feedback. When Strauss wrote his burlesque for piano and orchestra, von Bülow dismissed it as hot garbage. Strauss's deep admirations for his conducting tutor meant that he really took these criticisms to heart. It didn't help that the piano part of this is rather difficult, and von Bülow had rather small hands. The fact that Strauss's mature style was so different from his early works is not surprising. That's actually normal. What's really interesting is that these early pieces, which would usually, in other composers' collected works, be dismissed as mere juvenilia, these still have solid roles in the repertory of certain instruments. His first horn concerto, which was written pretty early on in his career, sounds nothing like the pieces he would come to write, and yet you cannot find a professional hornist out there who has not studied Strauss I. Strauss is not known as a symphonist. He did write two early symphonies but these were abandoned as a form. He occasionally programmed them, but he began writing in a genre that he thought was the natural successor to the symphony. This was the tone poem. He didn't invent the tone poem. Liszt actually did. He called it the symphonic poem, although the differences between a symphonic and a tone poem is largely a matter of semantics. Whatever you want to call them, suffice it to say, that between the mid-1880s and the mid-1910s, Strauss focused a lot of his effort on writing a series of increasingly complicated stories for orchestra. He thought of these as narrative-based pieces. With each one, he increased his ability to tell stories through music, each one becoming more and more explicit in its painting of scene-to-scene -scene and moment-to-moment. With a great Strauss tone poem, you can just sit back, let the music flow over you, and you can just see it like a movie in your mind, the story that he's trying to tell. At the height of his powers in the genre, Strauss was able to write compelling pieces of music that stood on their own, but still told stories. He did not invent this formula, per se, but he was instrumental in refining it, really polishing the form up and showing it off, what it could do for the future of orchestral music. There was a reason that a lot of composers who were contemporaries of his thought that the symphony, even if they were writing of them, was dead. He was to the purely orchestral piece what Wagner was to the opera, because Wagner believed that the drama of his operas was not necessarily in the singing. It was in the orchestra. It was in the music. Whereas Strauss's tone poems are obviously much shorter and they do not contain any vocal elements, but the core principle that you're telling the story through music was still there. Strauss pushed the orchestra to its limits, and then pushed even beyond that. From a technical perspective, what he demanded of all of his performers was astounding. Essentially, he wanted to have each member of the orchestra be good enough to be a concerto soloist, and he wrote virtuosically for every instrument. There's not a professional string player alive who hasn't, throughout their career auditioning for various gigs, 
wrestled with passages from Don Juan or Don Quixote, and Hornists still really struggle with the opening of Till Eulenspiegel's Merry Pranks, which is rhythmically very complicated and uses a wide breadth of what the horn can do. Strauss paved the way for the virtuosity expected of all members of an ensemble when later composers would write concerti for orchestra. Now, the term concerto for orchestra is a contradiction in terms, but the groundwork for pieces like that was set by Strauss's tone poems because he brought the level of proficiency of each player up to new standards. From a tonal perspective, he continued to push the boundaries. His early works are still very much in keys, but then he starts experimenting with more chromaticism and more modulation to the point where you don't really know what key it's in. Some of his later works even contain fragments of polytonality. His works were also extremely significant simply from a firepower perspective. He calls for so many instruments that it's hard for modern performances to be mounted. He used twice the standard orchestral complement of horns almost by default. He also was fond of other more obscure instruments, especially auxiliary instruments within the wind section. In his tone poem Symphonia Domestica alone, he uses an oboe d'amour, a rare oboe pitched between the concert oboe and the English horn, as well as a clarinet in D, which is like the clarinet in E-flat, only one more rare, and two slightly less obnoxious sounding. But he blew even this way out of the water with his final tone poem, An Alpine Symphony. This piece was slow in its gestation, but was finally produced after Strauss learned of the death of his fellow composer, conductor, and brass enthusiast, Gustav Mahler. In addition to calling for, amongst other things, an obscure bass oboe known as the Hecklephone, Strauss calls for, and brace yourself, 20 horns. 20 horns! Do you know how expensive that is? You know how hard it is to find one good horn player? It's a, one of the most difficult instruments to play in the entire orchestra, and he calls for 20. Be why would... What? I'll tell you what, if Mahler and Strauss were having some kind of friendly competition to see who could write for more horns in an orchestra, Strauss clearly won. I mean, Mahler was still very much dead at the time he wrote it, but still. How are you going to top 20 horns? This does bring up an interesting point, because Mahler and Strauss are often compared. And even though they weren't really close friends, they certainly admired one another's work, even if they didn't fully understand one another's compositional outlook. Mahler was more notable in his heyday as an opera conductor than a symphony composer, and he was unable to get Strauss's opera Salome past the Viennese censors. And Mahler was absolutely enraged by this, because he really admired this piece and he wanted to bring it to the Viennese public. Yet the reason that Strauss and Mahler were never quite on the same page has a lot to do with the fact that they didn't have the same underlying philosophy. Strauss was very much into the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche and Arthur Schopenhauer, while those two, especially Schopenhauer, were also an influence on Gustav Mahler, Mahler was still, at heart, a very spiritually inclined person, whereas Strauss wasn't. I mean, sure, Mahler was willing to convert from Judaism to Catholicism for the sake of getting a job, but he was still very spiritually inclined. The point is that you can't look at Mahler's music through an atheistic worldview, whereas for Strauss, you can. Strauss described his own Alpine symphony as a glorification of mankind through the strength of mankind's will alone a glorification of what it meant to be human without any sort of spiritual or religious undertones. He believed so strongly in wanting to portray that in this piece that he tinkered with calling the piece the Antichrist, which was itself a name of a Nietzsche volume. But you might say, well, he wrote Death and Transfiguration. Surely anyone who writes about Transfiguration is at least a little bit spiritual, correct? Well, not exactly. Death and Transfiguration was the first of his tone poems to be based around his own narrative and not someone else's story, but it still falls squarely into the realm of spiritual but not religious, and it's still the closest thing to something like that that Strauss ever got. Strauss, as far as I know, never mentioned any religious dogma as the basis for the Transfiguration part of Death and Transfiguration. It is his most spiritual and most Malarian of pieces, but that doesn't mean that he was necessarily thinking of it as a real transfiguration. In fact, Strauss's own writings of this are so unclear that some analysts have even postulated that it's some kind of metaphor for an artist who becomes only recognized as a great artist after their own death. 
The single best metaphor for this complicated relationship between Mahler's music and Strauss's music that I've ever heard compares music to a temple. For Mahler, the temple still had something inside, whereas for Strauss, the temple was empty inside. Sure, you still had the edifice, and you still had the beauty, but the meaning that Mahler imbued his music with was simply not there for Strauss once you dig deep into what he really meant. Strauss had a much closer relationship to opera than Mahler did. Mahler never wrote a mature opera, even though he was a renowned opera conductor. Strauss, on the other hand, really pushed the envelope, especially in his operas Salome and Electra, where he goes so far to the brink that they're technically atonal in some passages, or at least extremely chromatic that the tonal center is completely avoided. Salome goes even further in terms of the staging requirements. It requires a mature, full-throated Wagnerian soprano voice in the body of a teenage girl. That in and of itself is hard to mount. There's also an on-stage striptease, and it's based around a biblical story. You can understand why it couldn't get past the Viennese censors. It is a profoundly gripping work that breaks a lot of the rules of opera. In addition to all these staging requirements, it's in one act and features no overture, which is not super odd nowadays, but back then it really broke the rules partially because it was based on a play by Oscar Wilde. Proceeds from these two operas were enough for Strauss and his family to live off of comfortably for some time. Unfortunately, Strauss decided that he was going to store his fortune in the Bank of England, and when World War I engulfed the continent, these funds were appropriated as enemy contraband, and he was left destitute. But fear not, he was able to overcome this with his very next opera. Strauss was also appointed the director of the Vienna State Opera, and in this role, he felt like he could push back against what he saw as a growing museum culture of opera companies only playing the repertoire staples. He made sure to program new works on a regular enough basis without sacrificing the cash cows of the repertory staples. All the same, he was cautious about actually programming his works. Even though at this point he was a very successful opera composer, he didn't want to feel like he was rewarding himself by scheduling and programming his own works. Hitler reportedly loved Salome, for some reason, probably due to some of the anti-Semitic undertones present in Oscar Wilde's libretto. But he could have just as easily denounced it for decadence. But Hitler was not really known for being ideologically consistent. When the Nazis came to power, they appropriated Strauss and Strauss's music in the same way that they had appropriated Wagner's music. They wanted these two composers to be the pinnacle of great Germanic achievement in the field of classical music. But the difference between these two composers couldn't be more profound. Wagner's infamous anti-Semitism lived on in his children, and his children had deep ties to the Third Reich. They wanted their patriarch's legacy to be enshrined in Nazi ideals. Strauss, on the other hand, I mean, A, he was still alive, and B, he was mostly apolitical. The only political feelings he had were that the Nazis were full of it. Strauss's reputation is sometimes tarnished because he was seen as some kind of Nazi sympathizer or collaborator, but the truth is much more complicated. Strauss never joined the Nazi party, he never said Heil Hitler, and in fact many of the high-ranking Nazi officials didn't like him, they thought they just had to use him for his propaganda value. As a result, Strauss was appointed the president of the newly formed Reichsmusikkammer in 1933, without his consent. They didn't ask him, he just got appointed to this role one day. This role was essentially equivalent to the Secretary of Music, but the Nazis were far more devious than just having a Secretary for Music. They wanted musical propaganda. They thought it was a coup for them in the early days of their reign of terror to get Strauss on their team, so to speak. Strauss believed that his position in the Nazi government would lend him an official clout, so to speak. That him having an official position, however small it was, would lend him far greater leverage in shaping the musical culture of Germany than if he resigned. He fought the bans on the music of Jewish composers and of the composers that the Nazis deemed degenerate. This was largely unsuccessful. What was more successful was his lobbying for better copyright protections within Germany. He was able to get that. He also lobbied for better working conditions and better pay for his musicians, as well as more government funding for the arts. After all, if they were going to dictate what was and wasn't to be played, he might as well get them well paid for it. Primarily, Strauss wanted to use his status to help shield 
his Jewish daughter-in-law and Jewish grandchildren from the gas chambers, and he was able to do this. However, their Jewish family was not so lucky. Many of their family members were slaughtered, despite Strauss's incessant pleas to the contrary. When his letters went unanswered by the Nazi brass, Strauss drove to Theresienstadt to try to convince the officials there to let his family's family go. But this was also unsuccessful. Strauss, as it turned out, only had so much sway, and he pretty quickly ran out his welcome with the Nazis. He only barely shielded his daughter-in-law and grandchildren from the Gestapo, and they were all confined to house arrest in the last act of the war. In fact, his role as president of the Reichsmusikkammer only lasted for two years, because the Gestapo in 1935 intercepted a letter that Strauss had written to his longtime collaborator, the poet Stefan Zweig, where Strauss complained that his role was nothing but a pencil pusher. Though Strauss told the authorities that this letter was taken the wrong way, it was clear that Strauss thought of his role as merely a figurehead, as an act. When American troops liberated Strauss's home, Strauss introduced himself as the famous composer, and a music-loving sergeant recognized this and made sure that his house was off-limits. Word got around that this was where Richard Strauss lived, and soldiers stationed around the area made sure to pay a visit if they were so able. The elderly Strauss ripped through passages from his early operas at the piano and gave master classes to all of the troops who were interested. One of these soldiers was John DeLancey, eventual longtime oboist of the Philadelphia Orchestra, who suggested that Strauss write an oboe concerto. Strauss at first hated the idea, but apparently it kept bouncing around in his head and within a year, his oboe concerto was published. If you're familiar with the name John DeLancey, you're probably more familiar with his son of the same name, who is an actor, and whose acting credits include everything from Star Trek to My Little Pony. Who'd have thought I would be talking about My Little Pony in a Strauss video? <laughs> Strauss was distraught at the state of Germany and what the Nazi regime had done to their collective artistic heritage. Opera houses were bombed out. Innumerable artists were silenced via execution and morale was an all-time low. After a long period of quiet, Strauss geared up again and produced a series of late works which included his oboe concerto, as well as a piece for 23 solo strings called Metamorphosen. And this is a beautiful lamentation that combines the counterpoint and the emotional catharsis that Strauss believed had made German music great. A Beethoven quote from the funeral march of his third symphony is labeled In Memoriam. Strauss critics, at this point unfamiliar with the exact nature of his relationship to the Nazis, assumed the worst about his political sympathies when they saw In Memoriam written in this piece. As we've seen, the idea that Strauss was writing an In Memoriam for Hitler or somebody is patently absurd. He's more likely lamenting the loss of German culture, or, more straightforwardly, lamenting the death of Beethoven. He was completely cleared during the denazification trials, and yet many still harbored feelings that he was some kind of secret Hitler sympathizer. You might think that if you were in his position, you would leave as soon as possible, but then you realize that with his family situation, that was all but impossible. He could have left, but that would have left his family in the most dire of straits. He did what he could to save the few that he could save. This late period nicely and poetically bookends his career, he produced a second and final horn concerto, bookending his career with his favorite instrument, and then published his four last songs for soprano and orchestra. He knew he was dying, he knew these would be his last pieces, his last songs definitely if not his last pieces pieces, and he poured all that he could into these pieces. I'm saying pieces a lot, I'll try to stop. At one point when the soprano sings about death, a quote from Death and Transfiguration pops up. Not long afterwards, Strauss himself was on his deathbed, and according to legend, he said, It's funny. Dying is just how I wrote about it in Death and Transfiguration. He passed away in September of 1949 at the age of 85. To the last, Strauss was a composer deeply confident in his ability to tell stories, and yet at the same time could be extremely self-deprecating, once calling himself a first-class, second-rate composer. His works all pushed boundaries to one extent or another, but they didn't push boundaries enough, and after Salome and Electra around the turn of the century, he turned away from the extreme, almost atonal language, the expressionist language, in all honesty, that he used in those pieces, into something that was more classically romantic. 
which was still very chromatic, but wasn't anything near Schoenberg's 12-tone technique, or the very mathematical serialism that developed out of it. As a result, by the time Strauss died, he was seen as one of the last romantics, a holdover from a bygone era, much like people viewed Sergei Rachmaninoff. Like Rachmaninoff, Strauss's works have never fallen out of the orchestral repertory. Detractors would paint him as someone who brought nothing new to the table, someone who just took the language of Wagner, extended it through his instrumental music and his operas, until it could be picked up by the budding realm of film composition by the time of his death. These are the same detractors who pick on film music just for being film music, so I don't really think a lot of their opinion. There's something to be said for a composer who can really tell a story, and Strauss not only does this in his operas, he does it in his orchestral music as well. It's a very difficult thing to do, and he did it very well. Strauss also always thought of composition as a job. If you were a mason, you laid bricks. If you were a school teacher, you taught kids. If you were a composer, you wrote music. There are really no periods in his life where we see Strauss suffering from anything we might call writer's block. The periods in his career where he didn't write as much music, he was busy doing other things administratively or just trying to keep his family and himself safe. He was a kind and doting grandfather, and he had no time for the extreme demands other composers put on their families. The Sibeliuses or the Schumanns had to suffer in extreme silence as the composers in their families wrote and went about their work. Strauss didn't need this. Most people are familiar with the Strauss tone poem, the opening of Also Sprach Zarathustra, used as the opening of Stanley Kubrick's landmark science fiction epic 2001, A Space Odyssey. I think it's kind of ironic that this is his most famous excerpt, and yet it's like one of the more tonally stable things he ever wrote. Not just in his pieces writ large, but in the very piece from which this comes from, which features a 12-tone fugue and a bitonal ending. Strauss truly knew that he was the last of the Romantics, but unlike Mahler, who saw himself as the last in line of the great Germanic symphonist, Strauss never really got freaked out by it. Strauss's awareness of his historical role and importance led to neither existential agony nor self-aggrandizement on his part. And I think that says a lot about who he was as a person.